Get ready. Turn your iPhone to max volume. Snug those earbuds tightly in your ears. Take a deep breath. Fasten your mental seat belt for this wild audio roller coaster ride with Michael Garfield. You have talked about intuition a few times in some podcasts and how you like spent some time cultivating your intuition and I was just curious, you know, kind of what, you know, maybe being less in touch with your intuition looked like, how you sort of like got motivated to get, to try to foster it more and what kind of benefits have you seen or like, it, and also like, I guess, what techniques or things have you employed to try to foster that connection to your intuition? Okay, so I'm going to link this to a book I have not read, mm -hmm. but a friend told me about years ago uh, called Thinking Fast and Slow, where they talk about system one and system two thought, right? Which is like, you've got your fighter pilot thought, and then you've got your like analytical sitting there and chewing on the kind of thought. Mm -hmm. And these are different systems in the brain. I don't, you know, I know that there's a whole conversation around, you know, just how sort of neuroanatomically supported that way of seeing things is. But it, it is, it is helpful, I think, yeah. to understand that there are situations that call for, you know, careful consideration and situations that call for snap judgments. And, I think the the accelerating pace, quote unquote, the accelerating pace of modern life mm -hmm. is um, is actually about the pace of specific media environments and the percentage of time that we're spending in those environments. Because it's like in a forest, time is going just as the same pace that it always has. Yeah, you know. But it's like when you when I go to work. And then I'm on this like caffeine fueled media binge all day where I'm, you know, I'm just like reading and sharing and reacting to things as fast as possible. That's more like in my frame of reference, it's more like flying an X-wing through an asteroid field, <laughs> you know? And so the, the decision like feedback loop in that has to get really small and tight. Yep. Um, you know, so Again, um, so for me, I think the more that I have leaned into living and working in those kinds of environments, the more I've found that there is a place for, you know, slow cogitation, uh, but it's also really it, – and it's important to understand how to think something through logically. Mm -hmm. um, but – Logic, as I was just uh, uh, listening to on the Star Star Trek Discovery last night, uh, talking about like logic is a, is a strategy for making your way through an uncertain world, mm. and the um, it, it it's not it's a model of uh, that allows us to relate to a mysterious reality, and it's not the only model. And there's, there's plenty of room for these other forms of intelligence and it's really important to cultivate those as well. And so, you know, I, I think I started looking at the, the whole thing about intuition. I started looking at it in an analytical way, like, the, like as a scientific hypothesis that I wanted to test and see if there was some way that I could determine whether or not these thoughts I was having were valid, mm -hmm. you know, like whether, like if I had a hunch about something, was there a way that I could figure out whether acting on that hunch was giving me a, a benefit of some kind? And so, 
I uh, I started just asking whomever, you know, yeah. like, and I think about this, like the way that I've been thinking about this the whole time is very like organic and embodied that it, it may just be as simple as, you know, that your body, that your senses are picking up so much that you're not consciously aware of. Right. And that, so, so to act on, you know, to, uh, to perform a logical operation on only the contents of your consciousness is in some sense illogical mm -hmm. because you're not, you're not acting on all of the information that you actually have. And so the real creative innovations and profound revelatory insights tend to come out of some balance between these, you know, the, the conscious and the unconscious or, you know, between a logical consideration of something and this sort of intuitive or, you know, th this other kind of thinking. Mm hmm. And so I started asking just as sort of, you know, just an exercise, asking my own unconscious mind questions about my decision making hmm. and then disobeying them systematically, you know? So like I would, you know, I, there was one time in particular, I remember I was, I was, um, in traffic in Los Angeles while I was on tour, uh, and I was, I, I had this thought like, well, should I change lanes right now or should I stay put? And I said, oh, you should, you should change lanes right now. And I stayed put and immediately my lane went from like 70 miles an hour to a freezing halt. <laughs> and the lane next to me just kept going. Mm -hmm. And it was like, now that's a little weird because that kind of challenges the notion that that's just something that my body is picking up on because it was something that like, there's no way that I could have seen the, the, the traffic jam just looking at the car in front of me, like the way that the road it was, you know, and there's lots totally. of experiences like this. Um, lots of stories of this kind of thing where it's like, you can't, you, 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 your intuition is for sure acting on, information that you don't have yet consciously or unconsciously. And we can get to that later. I could just put a pin in that if you want, sure. but, but, um, so anyway, yeah, it's like for years I systematically disobeyed my, the good advice that I was asking for mm -hmm. until I became, conv and, and then like, you know, would sometimes would sometimes do it and find that some kind of magical, rewarding, beautiful situation would come out of it. Out of the disobeying? And, Oh no, out of the, or obeying. the obeying, okay. You know, just like just just you know, it's a qualitative study. Mm -hmm. But it was a, you know, like is the quality of my experience if I deny this advice better or is the quality of the experience generally better if I listen? Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, it would like listening was one of those things like when people talk about synchronicity and it like the more you the more attention you pay to it, the more synchronicities you have. Right. You know, the more magical sort of surprises and wonderful, delighting opportunities appear in your life. Mm -hmm. And it was like that. It was like the more the more I actually gave the voice a chance to speak, the more it had to say. Mm. And the more the more it would guide me, it seemed as though it was guiding me into uh, positive situations. So I started taking it pretty seriously. And then. But like there were times in my life and uh, I, I, I gave a, the talk on uh, transformational sobriety. I don't know if that's one that you heard. It's on um, evolution.bandcamp.com is where I keep all my old talks before I started the podcast. Okay, nice. I and there was, a, there was a talk I gave about that where I, I was – there was a period in 2012 where I was like smoking a lot of hash – Mm. and not listening to my intuition because <laughs> I think that like, uh, you know, uh, THC tends to sort of turn the attention on, you know, like it's, it's, I, I would say like almost like kind of neurotic thinking, like creative, but it's like, it's sort of, you're looking at your own mind and asking about it and you're mm -hmm. not like opened up in the way that like 
for example, psilocybin quiets that stuff and then allows this other signal to come through, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. And I think that like I was smoking so much and I think it has something to do with like dreams. Like a lot of people talk about like they, you, you lose your dreams when you're smoking a lot of weed, Yeah, you know? So at any rate, I was, I was, uh, in 2012, I was at a festival in Austin playing music and I had this clear intuitive signal to leave my car parked where it was in the campgrounds, even though it's not where I wanted, like I wanted to move my car and like, I was car camping. I wanted to set it up in a different way so that I would get sunlight at a different hour or whatever. Yep. And as soon as I moved my car, I had forgotten the guitar. And this one's, this one seems pretty mundane, but like the, the guitar I had left on top of the car and it fell off and like, there's like a foot long crack in the side of the guitar two hours before I had to play my set. Uh, and it's like, now that could have just been my brain saying like, Hey asshole, you left your guitar on top of the car. <laughs> right. But then uh, at the end of the weekend, my friends were trying to get me to stick around and I was tired cause I'd been sleeping in my car all weekend and I wanted to just drive home cause I was only an hour away. And because I had moved my car, my car was no longer facing the trees and I, I did not notice that I had a missing headlight and I got arrested mm. on the way home because I had a, uh, they stopped me for a broken headlight and searched me illegally oh, shit. and found this ball of hash in my pocket. <laughs> so like it, like that one was a clear and obvious situation where had I listened to this like urgent, insistent voice to do something and not the other thing. And uh, that, and I, obviously I spent a lot of time on, on, probation wondering you know why i had felt like i wasn't systematically disobeying that voice i right. was just like fuck it i'm gonna do what i want yeah you know and i think that there's there's this question of like well where is the voice coming from uh you know is it part of you if it is then what is this nonsense about like i'm gonna do what i want right you know you get into these like weird rabbit holes about identity and consciousness with that kind of stuff, um, where it's like, you know, my, my, my friend Norman Katz, who's a hypnotherapist talks about how hypnosis is not actually entering a trance because we're always in like a nested s set of trances, mm. you know, that, that you've got all these different sub personality modules running at any given time and they're all competing to be the one in the spotlight. But then like, as you, that, that hypnosis is about trance selection but it's not about going deeper into a trance. You know, it's just about being more intentional about the trance that you're okay. already, that you're always in, Yeah. you know? So at any rate, that's, that's sort of the short history. Like that was the moment, um, you know, that, that brush with the law was the moment that I realized that I really needed to do what I, what I can in my life to structure my self and my mind so that I'm willing, so that I'm not just like blowing off this information when it comes to me. Because I was like, why did, yeah, why did I diso? Like I had already gotten to the point where I felt like I had convinced myself that I was getting good information from this voice mm. and that I had learned to tell the difference between <laughs> good information and bad information. Cause sometimes it's just some sort of, you know, like, there's the angel on your shoulder and the devil, right? Like yep. sometimes it's it's just some little like neural motif that wants you to eat another Snickers bar, you know? And it's yes. like you gotta you exactly. gotta know the difference between the tiny thing that only has its own sort of like limited interests, and the the voice that's taking into consideration at like the as much of you as possible, mm. you know? Like what is really in your best interests? Um, so yeah, I'd say like. Since then, it's been, it's, it's been, I think, less about a question and answer because, again, like that, that strikes me as um, kind of perverse. <laughs> like if it's really your own mind giving you this information, um, then 
why are you having a conversation with it? That's kind of like psycho, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, uh, like it would be better. It's not like I'm asking my eyes what they see, (laughs) you know, it's like, I'm just seeing things. (laughs) So I've been working since then more on getting it down from like the, you know, trying to close the loop of question and answer into just a single, uh, like a single knowing in which like knowing and acting are the same thing. Mm. And I just know moment to moment what I should be doing because I'm constantly open to that sense and I'm listening to it, you know, and I'm not, it's not just like every once in a while I'll come to a decision point where I feel like I need to, you know, consult the oracle <laughs> right. or whatever, you know, it's just a constant process. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways that I, have been sort of thinking about this stuff. And I don't know if it accounts for the more like metaphysical beyond mind examples, but sort of this concept that we are born pure or something that, you know, and then as we grow, we form these sort of crusts around us of maladaptive, uh, things to protect us from not getting the love we need to survive as babies or whatever. Um, and so we sort of cover up our own, if you want to call it authentic self, we sort of trap it in these little, uh, maladaptive behaviors. And so even as simple as like, um, you know, if you have to take a shit or something, but you're in the car as a kid, you're in a car ride and you can't stop. And so you have to ignore your own needs to please, you know, your parents or whatever. And you get better (laughs) as a new parent. (laughs) You you better hold it in. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so, but I feel like I've started to notice like, Oh wow. I think that just goes very deep to where like maybe what I would really, uh, want or need, Sometimes I don't even, I'm not even aware of it because I'm so used to having to adjust my decisions or personality to make sure that I have like the love that I need, the acceptance from my friends and family and community and all that. Well, it's like, um, did I, I listened that same summer I was listening to 2010. I was listening to Charles Eisenstein's book, the ascent of humanity Mm. on audio. Like there's, someone had had like a volunteer had taken up upon herself to read the whole book and like release the recording. And it's, it's, uh, it's epic, man. She always, she was like interjecting with her own commentary the whole time. And like, anyway, um, but in that book, he, he writes about the crisis of somebody who has been working at, you know, in like the factory for their whole life. Sure. And then they get laid off and they've found every, you know, all of their purpose and their identity is tied up in this job that was temporary. Mm-hmm. And now they don't know who they are anymore. And you talk about like, you know, my dad is retired and he knows some people that are, that, you know, he knew from work that are older than him that have accumulated way more money, mm-hmm. but they're still working because they don't know how to stop Mm. and you know, they don't know what they would do with themselves because they've spent the last 50 years just like hustling in the business world. And they don't, you know, that's what that they've rewired themselves to like, that's what satisfies them. So like, I don't know if, you know, in that case, like, is it really in some sense, like I think you got to take it on a case by case kind of like psychoanalytic sense but with you know that hypothetical person is it really better for them to retire you know like is it is it really inauthentic for them to derive their meaning from their work now or are is it inauthentic are we trying to project upon them some sort of idea about what will help them define themselves and find purpose and like what's actually good for them. And we're just sort of like colonizing their minds (laughs) or attempting to, but then the Charles Eisenstein thing was kind of, you know, the other side of that, which is that 
sometimes you, you know, like life happens and you're a dancer and you're in a car accident and you lose your leg. And mm-hmm. then, you know, or you've, you've been working in the Ford plant for 30 years and then you get laid off. Yeah. And then it's not that like, it's, it, again, it's like the, the, it just takes time. Like it, it's like it, the argument in defense of boredom, mm-hmm. you know, like if you, if you aren't thinking, if you don't have the time to just be and allow like, and watch the contents of your mind on it, you know, like when you're just like in neutral, yep. then you don't know what's down there. Yep. And there is something, there is something, you know, the, the, the counter argument to what I just said is that, yeah, there is something more authentic about it, about your, you know, like you can express yourself more deeply, more completely if you make space for that kind of thing to emerge. And that he was like, well, it may actually be a good thing if we end up losing, you know, millions of jobs to technology, because then these people who have been stuck in this hustle for their whole lives are going to find out what they really care about. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah. I've been going through that, honestly, because for a long time I, I worked just regular full-time jobs, not necessarily nine to five, but enough structure and consistency over the past, like more than a decade to where you don't realize how much you, that is your identity or it structures your life enough to where you really identify with sort of a small window of things that you have time to, uh, explore. And then, uh, over the past couple of years, I've been doing mostly freelance work and it's just been a completely different lifestyle. And in a lot of ways, it has been a really an identity crisis, essentially, (laughs) you know, you just kind of experience, uh, yeah, just, well, for one, I've encountered the fact that, um, you realize how much you allow other people to structure your life and the things you're willing to sacrifice for, for companies or whatever you need to do to make a buck, you know, get up at 6 a.m. Uh, every day to get to work by 7, spend eight hours there working. But then when it comes to doing your own stuff, it's really easy to just not discipline, you know, not take that discipline from yourself for the things you actually care about in your own life as you would from an employer, you know what I mean? Well, there's, I mean, listening to you talk about this reminds me of, um, there's a developmental kind of shift, I think that, that we're talking, we're both talking about here, which is structuring your identity based on the rules and the roles of the system in which you live, Mm. you know, like being, you know, being a, a good Christian, you know, which means you know, it, it means all sorts of different things depending on your community. For sure. But usually, usually it means being devout and like being, you know, good with the, you know, being a good family person, good yep. son, good daughter or whatever. And then, um, you know, like we see like the Protestant Reformation as a kind of harbinger of this shift into authoring your own value system. You know, and so like th- there's a profound difference between, at least in the original, art, you know, the original articulation between just accepting what the priests tell you God is trying to get you to do yep. versus reading the Bible yourself. And that's why it was so disruptive and so, uh, totally. so contentious. And then like in, in uh, you know, like Robert Keegan, a uh, Harvard developmental psychologist has this book in over our heads, the mental demands of modern life, mm-hmm. where he says, this is the real problem. This is why we have so many so much stress and burnout, um, in this modern world, because the landscape of choice and personal interpretation and uh, has opened up to us so much that it's like a Nietzschean God is dead thing where you have to be the guy that's making that decision now. Mm. And, uh, and a lot of people are not developmentally prepared for that. You know, they like it, it is a, it is a crisis, uh, at that threshold between other people telling you who you're going to be and then you telling yourself who you're going to be. And in my own life, 
uh, it's weird because it sounds like you and I are kind of uh, Flip passing it in opposite directions <laughs> yes. here. Where I've That's like the, the last six I've months, I've only I've been working this this job for an employer, yep. which is like the first time in my life that I've ever had stable work with like regular hours and benefits and this mm-hmm. stuff. And I've always looked at my my father and other people in my family who were like company men. Yeah. And been like, what the hell is that? Yeah. And now I've got an embroidered jacket with the <laughs> Santa Fe Institute logo on it. And I love wearing it. And it's yeah. like, cool. But it is like, it's, I look back on, you know, the, the, you know, 13 years I was a self-employed artist and I'm like, shit, man. Like I really was, I wasn't really a, a self-authoring modern type of person in that time, I really was still sort of just like running around trying to figure out how to fit the, you know, like what, what the terms of success are Mm. and how to like do those things, you know, rather than, Uh. rather than being like, I'm going to live my life on my own terms. And I think it actually, you know, when, when I had Eric Godsey on future fossils, he was talking about this, about the importance of like, learning to play the rule, play by the rules before writing your own rules, Mm. you know, like the absurdity of a 23 year old life coach. Yes. You know, and And I think, you know, you also brought up the, uh, which I really, uh, I liked, you brought up this thing of, uh, sort of working your way up to these non dual experiences and what is it? Buddhist lineages or, or yogic or something. That it's like you yeah. don't you don't just dive straight into the non dual. You sort of <laughs> prepare yourself in some way. Well, I mean, yeah, it's or something. I, yeah, well, it was. We were talking about uh, how a lot of the older traditions put right this non dual meditation at the end of your life path. That yeah. it's like something. It's like the job of that. It's the it's what you do when you're old and accomplished, and you've reached you've you've reached all of the things. You've done all the things that you wanted to do with your life and you're still, you know, what's left. Sure. Right. Like again, to like look at my dad who's, who's retired and it's like, I think that at some point I could be wrong about this, but I, you know, the last time when he came to visit the baby for the first time, we had this conversation. It's like, well, you've been retired for five years and now you're starting to ask like, what's next? Mm. You know, now that you've sort of, you've had the career that you wanted which, you know, most people aren't even lucky enough to have that. Right. And then like now you've had this time to just sort of like come back to managing your own schedule and choosing how you live your day. And is it possible that like, I think for a lot of people, they, um, they never get beyond that to like, uh, I, I was telling him about Abraham Maslow and how the Maslow's hierarchy originally uh, the hierarchy of needs ended with self-actualization, mm. with this, this self-authoring, like you're going to be the the fullest version of yourself that you can be. Yep. Um, but there's something past that. Uh, later later in his work, he added, I think, uh, self-transformation. Because mm. it's like you've it's like you've been chewing this mouthful of food for seventy years. <laughs> You know, and it's like time to swallow and take a bite of something else. Mm-hmm. And like most people, that's, you know, again, that Robert Keegan talks about, you know, when you at some point as a modern self authoring individual, you realize that your values exist in relationship to these other value systems that what you identify as only exists in relation to what you identify as not being yep. and that somehow that the unconscious and the other are a part of the self and it becomes way more complex and you start inquiring into the shadow material. Mm. You start, you start like looking at all of the things that you think of as not you, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of wondering like, is there a point when my dad is going to, be like, well, I've I'm done all the shit that I wanted to do, and now I want to see about doing some things that I didn't ever want to do, mm. and seeing like seeing if there's something in there, you right. know, like I can I can like find a new perspective on this 
this thing that I I cannot see at the all at once. Yep. You know, and, mm-hmm. but I don't, but I don't think like to to just like most of the people I know that have have gone through like what I would call would have had remarkable success at uh, spiritual realization early in life. Mm-hmm. Um, they end up, and this, I don't know, I, I got to be careful not to, this is not a totalizing statement, but sure. Uh, but like a lot of people, um, you just end up, it's like you, you know, like if you don't chew your steak enough, then your body has a hard time digesting it. Mm-hmm. And you end up with like people that have just like large amounts of rotting meat in their colon, <laughs> you know, right. like the body and then you can't break it down and it just starts to poison you from the inside. And I think that a lot of the people I've seen that awakened into non-duality um, in their like 30, 20s, 30s or 40s are sincere pricks. Yeah. Because they they have they like fought they like somehow like ex- like dislocated their jaw and swallowed the whole <laughs> ego and now it's like down in there hanging out undigested yeah. like it's still there only they're acting like it's not like it's not to them you know because they've succeeded in in uh denying it to their own awareness but man there was one guy in particular i got into it with it uh my burning man camp back in 2013 who was who was striking this guru posture and attracting these like uh, hordes of disciples in our little tea house. Mm. And he was trying to convince me that I would be, he was spending a lot of attention trying to convince me that I, that I was suffering and that I would be better off the way that he is. And I was like, well, what's, what is your motivation here yeah. <laughs> like what is why why does m- the fact that i still identify as like an i bother you as much as it does you know and it's right. like it, you can't you can't access the answer to that question if you deny the fact that you exist and therefore have your i don't know it's just it's just such it's it's a very sort of delicate thing it's like it's it's an easy mistake to make i mm-hmm. think yeah so what do you feel like you uh maybe missed out on or were lacking by going just fr- you know freelance musician artist uh lifestyle versus having you know now that you have sort of a uh an adult job if you will <laughs> if you, now that you're a company man you know what what do you find the benefits from that are and like you know if you didn't go down that freelance exploratory route would you have ended up at a place that really like resonates with you as much as i'm sure santa fe does you know what i mean because yeah um you know maybe there's something about all the experiences that you had during the the freelance lifestyle that helped you sort of hone in on something you would uh, appreciate doing, you know? Definitely. I mean, I think um, to answer, to answer the inverse of your question, I think maybe the, the most important thing I learned in my, like, I think about this often in terms of like the book of Exodus, like the Jews wandering the wilderness for 40 (laughs) years, you know, and like Moses gets to see the promised land, but never gets to really set foot in it. I think that there's something about, because, you know, really, I wanted, I wanted to be a part of this institute in 2005 when I was an undergrad. Mm. And it's not a graduate institution. It's like, you know, basically, unless you're a postdoc, they don't really have a spot for you um, as a student. And there wasn't another place that I was aware of at the time that was asking questions as broad as these questions about the origins of life and the evolution of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't find a way to ask these questions in academia as I knew it then, I just fell out and started doing my own thing. And I think that departure from the, you know, the 22 years of 
expectations of my own life that I had built up that I would be a career academic and that I would be, you know, teaching evolution in a college somewhere by now. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, resulted in a in a really profound sort of crisis, identity crisis, mm-hmm. where I was like, I don't know who I am. And so a lot of these different things, being a musician, a professional musician, a professional artist, a writer or whatever, all these things came out of me just throwing all the things I enjoyed doing at the wall and seeing what would stick. Right. And so the positive thing out of that is that I learned at at some point that it wasn't just an awkward situation to resolve, but mm. that that in some way uh, that, you know, that like I, I kept trying to fit into all these different communities, you know, trying to find my, my place, you know, find the, the zoo where I was like, Oh, look, you've got a an empty <laughs> Michael cage. I'll just <laughs> slot into that. Perfect. And, um, and it never worked. I never really felt like I fit anywhere. And then at some point I realized that like, this was probably more, this is probably more common of a case than I knew. And it wasn't limited to people that were just like, you know, striking their own path through the, you know, self-employment wilderness like I was. This is probably emotionally true for people that were, you know, working like in, in all kinds of different life situations. And the more I started to, uh, express the vulnerability of not knowing what the hell I'm actually good for or where I fit in the world. Yeah. The more I realized that that itself, that asking that question was what I'm doing in Mm. a weird way, like not knowing who I am is who I am. Right. You know, and that, that that's authentic um, at least, you know, to my own life experience and for many other people. And I started seeing, you know, rather than seeking the answers, I started seeking better questions. Mm. And so like, you know, that's really deeply informed everything. But the other side of it is that, you know, and I can't, you know, I, I, I will not say whether it's for the better or for the worse, but I, you know, I look around at a lot of people with, who had easier lives than I've had, uh, as adults, you know, who have more support, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, Eric Godsey is a great example. Like he, he, he followed those questions into a career at on it where he's supported in a way that I was not supported in my twenties, you know? And, uh, that's an especially rare circumstance. I realize, um, for a company to care, as much as that company cares right. about the self-actualization and individuation of its employees. Yep. But it's getting more common. Um, more and more companies are are willing to spend money on education for their, yep. their employees and so on. And, and I think that like, I, I really missed out on an opportunity to, to be supported by a community or by an institution um, that I was so... I was so hell bent on doing things in my own way mm-hmm. that I made things impossibly hard for myself. <laughs> I turned down a, I was, I, I submitted a, uh, my first album in 2006 to Candy Rat Records, mm-hmm. which is, um, you know, it's the, it's the label on which, you know, Andy McKee and a bunch of other really famous acoustic guitarists, uh, found their stardom. Okay. And, uh, I sent them this record and, uh, Rob Poland at Candy Rat hit me back and was like, I really like what you're doing. Um, but you know, I really like about half of this stuff and the other half, which is very different. I'm not as interested in that. And I'd love, I'd love to put out this record. If you can basically produce more of this stuff. And I was like, this record is a finished product. Uh, Like either you want it or you don't. And I blew him off and I've, and then like, you know, I've, I've, I've reached out to him again over the last, you know, 13 years and I have never received a reply because I blew him off. Like the guy offered me a record deal. And I feel like that was, I look back on that experience a lot being like, I wish basically what it boils down to is that there, I think there's a balance that you can strike where you can, you can, I didn't, part of this was that like, I didn't have a mentor Mm. 
you know, like I didn't have, I didn't have guides to like show me the way through this, you know? And I think that I, more than anything, I think I would have benefited from seeing, you know, trying to find outside of an academic institution or outside of a particular, uh, philosophical or business community, had I, had I really looked for people that were further down the path than myself who, with whom I really wanted to learn and really like put myself at the feet of these people. And Mm. I never, I never did that. And I think I suffered immensely because of it, because I, you know, because there's no reason for you to try and figure everything out from scratch, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't know. Now it's, now it's, uh, I feel like I've, I'm kind of like, I came into this job at SFI, like a little like beaten up and <laughs> like more willing, you know, in a weird spot now. Cause it's like, I'm not where I was 14 years ago when I first wanted to be a part of this situation. Sure. And, um, and yet now I realize that it's not about trying to find somebody that you just, it's not about like your guru or your role model, but it's about identifying the competencies and the the forms of intelligence and wisdom in people that are flawed human people Mm -hmm. that you can't just like pin your kite to, but you can learn from in a, in a, you know, a meaningful way. And like, so I'm at a point now where it's like, I accept that I have, I know things that the people that I want to learn from don't know yep. and that's okay. Yep. And I still have so much that I can learn from them. So I don't know. I mean, it was basically the answer is like, I think I made a typical male mistake that I could like figure this all out on my own <laughs> after my childhood role model disappointed me. And it like the, the sort of trauma of that experience booted me out into you know, well, who the hell am I? Um, and so mm-hmm. here we are, you know? Yeah. You brought up something in there that I remember you, well, a couple things. One of them was the, uh, you, you mentioned maybe it was on the, maybe it was on one of the Eric Godsey, either you on his or him on yours. It was the, uh, some, you said something to the effect of that, um, it's more beneficial to offer your questions and your vulnerabilities than, than your answers. And I personally thought that was really uh, a profound statement because that's something that I've been getting from listening to podcasts and now having a podcast of my own and talking to some guests is like people that I have looked up to, such as like yourself. Uh, I just talked to Colin Frangicetto from Circa Survive. I've been a fan of them. He came up on the conversation with Ramin. Uh, That guy is everywhere. Yeah, he is. Colin, you're a time-traveling synchro (laughs) wizard. (laughs) And I've been into his band for a long time. I'm into his art. And to hear, uh, you know, I love to hear about uh, strategies and theories and all of that stuff is super fun. But honestly, the most powerful thing for me has been to hear you talk about your struggle being a self-employed person and having an identity crisis from the outside. You would never expect that or Colin to talk about how he, you know, questions what he's doing. There's times where he's down to $5 in his bank account. It's like that stuff has meant more to me than anything else because I don't know, it just helps me personally just feel like connected, you know, like we're all in this together. We're all experiencing the same things, no matter where we get to, how many followers we have, what types of success we have, how much is in our bank account. Like we're all experiencing these same things of wondering who we are and and just trying to get by it, you know, and trying to find some joy and peace in the world. Dude, yes. Like I, before Future Fossils, I, I, kind of sort of started another podcast when I was the editor for, uh, soul purpose.com S O L, which I think is now, I think the website's down and it's just a Facebook page and it isn't, it's just a shadow of what it was, but it was like (laughs) the spot where the, you know, the visionary art, uh, and festival culture was, was being explored in a, in a, in a deeper way. Mm. And I wanted to do an interview series with various, 
sort of legendary visionary artists and and musicians in that scene who, you know, for whatever reason, that scene, I think it's sort of part of the the structure of the media environment that you have this like, you know, DJ or like this famous painter like Alex Gray or whatever on stage. Yeah. And they're sort of the, sh you know, quote unquote shaman that's mm. leading people through these profound rites. And so we have this psychological transference and uh, projection mechanisms in there where we, you know, we assign all of our own sort of divine dimensions to these people that are, you know, in the spotlight. Right. And I, and I wanted, I wanted to have a, a, a podcast where we basically just interviewed like people like Kalia Scintilla talking about how he's like sleeping in his car between gigs and, mm. you know, and, and, and how, how difficult it is to, to quote unquote, live your dream in a, you know, a, a social media environment that's constantly, it's like the fucking cube, right? It's like constantly restructuring itself to become more and more impossible for you to live in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and just make it clear because it's fucking annoying to be a struggling artist that has to present yourself in a, you know, in, in a way that is inspiring to people. And in so doing, you end up you know, this is a very common thing about why Facebook is depressing is that like everybody's trying to show like the best experiences of their lives. Yeah. And so everybody looks like they're having a better time than <laughs> you are. And the reality of it is, it's like, you know, I, I, I got all these messages over the years from people that were like, basically, you know, fuck you. You're so, you know, like you've got it all, you know, you think you know everything or sure. you've got it all figured out. And like, my life is so much harder than yours. And I'm like, if we were really having like a Vulcan mind meld here, then we would both have things that we feel envy about the other person's life. And we would both have things that we feel like gratitude for not having to deal with that, no you know? Doubt. And like, there's like the, uh, the Dirk Diggler from Boogie Nights. <laughs> it's like, have you really thought through the consequences of having like a 16 inch dick? You know, it's like just cause you've got this one thing, <laughs> right. that, you know, it's like, that's it. There's like all of these other things that totally. become more difficult. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that the human, the human dimension is really interesting and, and it's, it's, it's cool that for, you know, for all of the, the ways that these new media complicate, our lives and make certain things a lot more confusing. Um, it does seem like it's opening up this profound opportunity for those who are willing to cultivate compassion for the, for what would otherwise seem like, uh, you know, like does anybody really want to grow up in the Trump family? Right. You know, like, right. does, does anybody really want Donald Trump's childhood? Mm -hmm. it's, and it's like easy to understand. It's easier to understand why the guy is the way that he is when you look at those things. Yep. You know, and it doesn't make him right. And it doesn't exactly. mean that we, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't impeach him, you know, and like throw him in jail. Yeah. But it's like you then, but it, it removes the charge around like, I, I don't understand why anyone would ever act that way, mm -hmm. you know, like that's so, and I think that that's like the, the hurdle that we're going to have to get over as a species here, you know, if we're going to work together. How would you describe the hurdle in its succinct way? What's the hurdle you mean? Um, sort of having this understanding and for c compassion for what we see is I would never be that. There's no way, like, how could you imagine, you know, I can't imagine that I would ever be Donald Trump or, you know, that sort of yeah. a thing. Yeah. 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 I yep. think the hurdle is, the hurdle is, uh, I, is the statement, well, I don't see why it, this is a problem for you. Right. You know, like, yeah. I can't understand why you would have a problem with this. Yeah. Uh, or the, um, you know, like at, at SFI, they talk about it in terms of economics. Like uh, originally economics was modeled in terms of, well, everyone is, you know, acting in rational self-interest. 
Mm. But then we, we learned so much about the brain that we, we, we started thinking, actually, no, <laughs> most of people's activities are irrational. Mm. And it's like, but then there's another layer which actually restores the thing that it's like, actually, it's not that most activ- most people's behaviors are irrational. It's that they are rational within a context that you don't understand. Mm. You know, that yep. like everybody is actually acting on, you know, acting on the best information they have and oriented to, you know, some sort of value that makes sense given the situation and you can agree with them or disagree with them or claim that, you know, like we've been badly enculturated or that we've been brain damaged or, you know, that there's all these like flaws to right. the reason, but it's not just that people are irrational and therefore need to be controlled by computers. Right. You know, it's like, that's, that is a fucking cliff and we're, we're, you know, that's, that's, that is not the, the way to handle this thing, the, the way they handle it, like Simon Dedeo, who's an SFI external professor, talks about this a lot. He's like, actually, no, it's it's that people have complex motivations and that they are acting rationally. Right. You know, but that it's it's that there's more than one kind of rational. Right. You know, exactly. Yeah. I had this crazy experience in in like 20, uh, 2011 to 2012. I worked at this, uh, basically a maximum security prison, Ooh. but it was a treatment facility, they called it. There wasn't much treatment going on, but it was a treatment facility for um, sex offenders. And it's still kind of weird to think about it. It was like another, it feels like another lifetime, but I would, uh, you know, I feel like sex offenders, like pedophiles in particular, is like one of the most challenging like if you want to try to find compassion, that's like, you know, the cream of the crop. That's like the hardest you can do. And so, but the thing that was so mind blowing uh, for me, maybe not mind blowing for me because I was already kind of had this type of uh, disposition anyways, but it was still, it was still very uh, enlightening is you would read, you could read their charts, you know, and you were kind of encouraged to read their charts just to kind of get to know uh, some of the people. And you'd read about what they had done and it was just the most horrible things you could imagine, you know. Um, but then you would read about their their childhood and things that happened to them. Mm. And then you're confronted with this issue of, you know, I mean, how can you judge somebody for what they've done when you when you know what has happened to them and how they grew up as like, you know, being raped as an infant by your own parents or whatever. And then they perpetuate some sort of similar thing. It's like, can you blame somebody for that? You know, and it it sort of ties into, I've heard you flirt a little bit with the whole free will versus not free will thing. And uh, you're one of the only people I've heard recently in, in the circles of things that I listen to that sort of, I resonate with and it sounds like you sort of not that any of us could um ever claim to to know what's really going on but I've definitely come to feel this strong sense especially when I'm at my most I have these you know spontaneous sort of transcendent states where I'm like pure observer consciousness and it's you can experience life just playing out in front of you and I don't know. I guess when I really think about it, it just, I really have the sense that are, are we really choosing any of this stuff that we're doing, you know, or like you said, are we working with, we're all working with the best possible information that we have and we're doing what we, you know, deep down feel is the best thing we can possibly do, you know, to, to get whatever it is that we need, love and acceptance or whatever. Yeah, I think that, you know, Galen Strawson, uh, the Oxford and UT philosophy professor, he had a really, he's got this really simple case against free will that's basically like, whatever you want is circumscribed by what you're, what you are like anatomically and culturally even capable of being aware of as options. Mm. And then also like what you're actually, you know, and, and then like, so it's like you're, 
it's what you want is like still within the spotlight of what you're conscious of, you right. know, and and so you know all sorts of you know neuroanatomical arguments aside, there's still this issue that choice as we experience it is limited by uh you know it's like a multiple choice test <laughs> yeah. and like is is going up to the starbucks and ordering you know a uh, a hazelnut <laughs> coconut milk cappuccino really the is that really like free will you know or are you just sort of like up but it, but then there's the other part which is th that if it were just sort of if your next move were unconditioned by that which came before, it wouldn't be free will either. It would be completely random, mm. you know? And so, like, how is that, how does that, that sort of possibility satisfy what people who argue for free will are trying to argue for? You know, it's like, yeah. that's, that's just chaos. That doesn't give you anything. Yeah. So I think that, like, this, you know the sort of ancient argument between are we choosing our destiny or not is just so played and so insufficient to the complexity of it. And that really what, it, you know, to, to, um, invite, uh, a sort of a spookier dimension to this conversation. Um, I've been gabbing on and on about Eric Wargo's book time loops lately. I've heard of it. <clears throat> And he talks about this. He says, you know, according to him, and I won't get into the, the whole argument for it. Just read the damn book. It's so good. <laughs> um, he basically says that the, you know, what we think of as like when we in quantum physics, when we found out that there's this indeterminacy, in, even in like subatomic particles yep. and that they appear to be exerting some sort of choice. Yeah. You know, that. There's a there's an interpretation of of quantum physics that the what we're seeing as random in that in that moment is information from the future from the future state of the system traveling back in time to complete a circular like a like a Mobius strip of causation where the past and the future are contributing to one another mm. and that so. He's like, so you don't really, it's not that you can change the past, but it's that your awareness of the past influences the outcome of the series of events that led to that right. observation. Yep. And so in that sense, you know, uh, he kind of stakes it out against free will because it, it looks like a mechanical, like a mechanistic deterministic system, mm -hmm. but it's one in which the determination is flowing past to future from the sort of material reality and then future to past yeah. from the interpretation of that yeah. history. That's wild. And so, and so in that sense, like we're, I think we're getting, if we step into that, we're getting closer to this notion that because he's talking about this sort of causal Mobius strip, that the notion, like the question of is our behavior determined by the sort of pattern of matter or is it determined by some sort of spark of interiority some some sort of mental mover you mm -hmm. know some or like does it or does it originate from inside or outside mm -hmm. well it's a fucking mobius strip the inside <laughs> is the outside yeah. you know they're they're like they they feed directly into each other yeah or you know so it's not like these are it casts the whole question in a completely different light and it makes the arguments for either one seem just like infantile, totally. you know, like just uselessly simple. Yeah. What you were saying about the time loops, it's funny. That's a, sort of a, uh, this is just a imagination sort of high idea I've had, <laughs> but, it, but it seems like it's encapsulating the same type of feeling. I'm really into like the work of Graham Hancock and, mm. and those guys. Um, and I'm fascinated with the pyramids and, and sort of deep time and Atlantis and these different ideas. Uh, and I've thought about 
this, you know, the ancient astronaut hypothesis and all of this stuff. And I started to think, it's very interesting to think about, so say we start to discover all of these different sacred geometries in the, in the pyramids and in these um, uh, ancient sites, and then they inform, like you said, the future of what we're kind of looking for. And if we get to a point, I don't know, basically what I'm trying to say is I imagined, well, what if, if there was some types of ancient astronauts in the future that go back to the ancient past to sort of uh, time capsule this knowledge then for the future? Like, what if it's us? Just what if it's future humans that actually <laughs> learned from the ancient cultures that they're going to go back and teach? You know what I mean? Dude, I mean, yes. I, I uh, So I was just talking about this with Ramin Nazar. No or shit. Nazar. About, about uh, who, the book Who Built the Moon. Oh, man. Oh, this is just like iterations of the same conversation. Bob Fisk was uh, just telling me about that. Do you know Bob? I do, yeah. Buddies Bob's with a Link, guy. yeah. I haven't yeah, read the book, Bob, but it sounds very interesting. <laughs> But so who built the moon is, is, uh, in it's a challenge to our theories of lunar origins because mm-hmm. they get in, they get into, um, how the, you know, the people who, the scientists who, who modeled, uh, the, you know, the impact origins hypothesis in computers claim that they're not, they're actually not confident in the model that they, they feel like they had to like sort of massage the data to get it to work the way they wanted. Mm. And, and so like we act as though we've got it all solved, but it's not, it's not that clear cut because even, you know, the people who came up with this idea are not happy, you know, as rigorous scientists with the, the sort of fudging that they had to do to get to that. And then, you know, they talk about all of the weird anomalous stuff that's just like, you know, if you're just sort of, if you're, if you're a skeptic who's willing to just attribute everything to the, like the law of large numbers and like, or, or the, the anthropic principle, you know, which is just that like, we see this unusual situation because we are the unusual situation. Right. And yeah. so, but, it, but he's like, or the authors of this book, um, they say, okay, well, let's look at, let's look at the facts, shall we? The, the moon is one four hundredth the diameter of the sun at one four hundredth the distance of the sun. Yeah. But it's in a, but it's in a decaying orbit. So the only time that the moon and the sun are the same apparent size in the sky and therefore a total eclipse is possible is right now at this moment in the 4.6 billion year history of our planet, when there are human beings standing on the surface of the planet Mm. to puzzle about that. And that the, there's like a there's a there's a litany of weird things like this. Like one is that the the diameter of the moon is twenty seven point nine three five percent the diameter of Earth. I think mm. that's the number. Um, and the lunar day is the same <laughs> to the thousandth point. It's twenty seven point nine three five. So it's like. These and these are numbers that these are these are ratios and correspondences that exist in the decimal system, which is just one of like countless possible mathematical worlds that are possible to inhabit. But like it's the one that we use, mm-hmm. you know, and and so their their argument for that is that whole thing is it sure looks like when you put all of this stuff together that the moon, which we also know was essential for the formation of life and of complex life and of intelligent life and of human civilization. Like it keeps, it keeps, uh, exerting this tidal influence on the story of this planet in potent and meaningful ways. It looks nothing like any other observed natural satellite. And, and we don't see any other, planets with life and we don't see any other planets with a a huge spherical tidally locked moon like this either. Mm -hmm. And so like, what the hell is going on here? And we don't have any good answers, which I I honor them for not like coming up with some, 
you know, Zechariah Sitchin, and this is how it really must have happened. Right. Then. Yeah. But like, they kind of suggest what you just suggested, which is, well, we're not happy with the idea that it was God because that's just kicking the explanatory can down the street. We're not happy with it being aliens because, again, if the moon is necessary for the formation of life, then where did they come from? Right. You know, so mm-hmm. like, uh? <laughs> and I remember, I remember uh, having that thought a few years ago that what if it is like uh, the way I was thinking about it at the time was like, what if it is that we, we, every time we look up in the sky, we're collapsing a wave, like a quantum wave function of all possible histories. And that when we look up in the sky, we get the history that can make sense. The only history that can make Mm. sense with the way that things are. And so like the, the, you know, this confirms like a lot of my sort of formative psychedelic experiences in my twenties when I had this thought that time was not like a sequence of events, but like every moment is a unique and self-existing like, uh, instance of creation, Mm. but that we, we sequence these, these moments, these distinct universes, we sequence, we sequence them in time according to the similarity of their constructs. Like the, like, like you remember being you five minutes ago, better than you remember being you at the age of five, because you are physically more like that guy. Like you're the antenna, you know? And so like, so we observe this history in which there is a moon because it's the only history that makes sense, you know? Yep. And so we've, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, so in that sense, it would suggest also that the same has to be true of this moment with respect to the future. And that like, that, yeah, we must be on some sort of unfolding causally determined, but as yet to be determined story that is like, we are the prequel to something that is going to like wake up one day and look at us. And that's when you get into some right. like, Terrence McKenna type stuff where it's, it's actually like the end of time. Everything has gathered into one mind and is looking back on history and like <laughs> ha- they're therefore creating its own bio, like creating its own story. Yeah. Like, like what is like, we're like, uh, working backwards, like rever- like every time we look at the world, we're like reverse engineering how mm. to get to where the world that we're living in now. Right. You know? So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm extremely sympathetic to that point of view. Yeah. I mean, if you get into, um, just the concept of sort of the world is as you dream it type of a thing. Or any, anything we create, you know, first has to be imagined. And so we, we definitely feed off, the, off of the past as far as how, what we imagine for the future. You know what I mean? So no matter what these ancient cultures were actually up to, depending on how we think about it and how we project that into the future, you know, sort of affects then what the future becomes. Totally. But it works the other way too. Like, um, I've been thinking a lot about, about, uh, how the, the new interpretation tends to pave over the last interpretation, Mm. you know? So, so, you know, this is, Uh, this is really obvious in like the technological metaphors for life. Like we used to think of, uh, the world as a book that God was writing and then it, it became, a, a clock that God, the watchmaker was building. And every time this, there's like this cognitive regime change in mm. culture, uh, which, you know, now is that life is a, is, a, a you know, a computer mm-hmm. and that the mind, you know, that the human being is basically, uh, like a cybernetic system executing these, these environmental programs. Um, and you, what it does is it, it, it retroactively, reframes everything that came before it, you know? So this question of like this, this, um, 
you know, that, that's one of the more interesting things about Wargo's book is that he shows, he's like, okay, so if you start from this uh, time loops point of view, then suddenly Jungian synchronicity is actually a misapprehension of uh, a, a causal loop where like the famous example of, of Jung and the, the, his patient who's had, had this dream about Jung handing her this precious piece of gold jewelry, uh, like a, an Egyptian scarab. Okay. And, and, uh, then he, uh, there's a tapping at the window and he opens the window and this, this like June bug flies in mm. and he catches it, hands it to her. And it's like, uh, Wurga's statement is that that's actually, that she had a pre a precognitive dream about the, the like because memory is like associated with like emotional experiences so memories of the future are are also mm. and a memory of the future in which you have the emotional reward of having this like mystical experience that's confirmed by your therapist who you're sort of like in love with and and you know really admire and it creates this occasion for him to initiate you into the the egyptian mysteries and you get this powerful learning experience and like of course that's the kind of the kind of experience that your dreaming mind is going to orient toward and the kind of thing, the kind of future event that you're going to, uh, potentially misapprehend as this sort of, you know, Oh, what a strange coincidence that this, you know? And so I, I, yeah. I admit that's so like in that sense, you look back at, uh, you know, like the, the possibility that, future events are influencing the outcome of past events mm -hmm. is, is, uh, recursive in that it is doing that. And it's also about that. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's like, we are actually like the more that we find of the past, the more of that quantum indeterminacy is like solved. Yep. And the, and I don't know. Anyway, the, the, this is a more, um, not so direct, like it actually changes the past type of thought, but it, it popped in my mind of even like uh, MDMA therapy for post-traumatic stress and how like having this new experience and reframing of your past can actually kind of change how you experience your own past in the present. Definitely. I mean, well, I mean, that's the same with, you know, going back to like self-authoring, um, you know, you can think of yourself as like, oh, you know, there was a moment where according to the value system that was imparted upon me as a child, I made a decision that was a bad decision and I'm a bad person. Right. And then I, or, or like, again, with the like the whole rational economics thing, you know, yeah. like suddenly if you see everybody acting on, you know, like the, the new frame completely changes the way that you understand the entire history of that thing. And so if you, with, with MDMA for PTSD, which is a, a great example of reconsolidating the memory, it's like you give yourself an entirely new story in which you have been, you are the one absolving yourself of the sin that you imagine yourself <laughs> yeah. to have committed. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, there's, there is this, that, I don't know when you when people talk about this kind of thing, it's it's often the case that people talk about like having experienced some sort of guardian angel as a child, mm. and then like mm. thirty years later they're in meditation on their childhood, oh, wow. and they realize they realize that they're the one that visited wow. themselves. You know, yeah. That they're, I mean, and of course that's like completely anecdotal, but it's a pretty right. common anecdote. Yeah, that that people are like visiting their own younger selves to like reassure them that it's not always going to be this shitty. Yeah, you know, and yeah, so. Wow, well, to kind of like jump back and maybe something we could hit on to sort of uh, put a bow on all this. Sure. Um, I kind of want to go back to the intuition stuff. And one of the things that popped into my mind as we were kind of going on about all of this is um, sort of this identity crisis or, you know, uh, flexibility in your personality or breakdown of your identity. And it sort of feels like that's really easy to feel like it's such a chaotic and uh, terrible 
thing, you know, it feels like a doom scenario. But it, I've f- been feeling like it it's also a ripe opportunity and that sort of to really get in touch with some of that intuition, maybe you do you need a certain level of that sort of identity crisis in some sense. Oh, I mean, definitely the <sighs> I like the, I like the idea that neurosis is just uh, undigested transformation, mm. you know, and that that uh, you really can't um, – well, I don't know. Like there's – to put it in – in like a psychedelic terms, the beginning of the trip tends to be, at least for me and for a lot of people I know, the hard part of the trip, mm. because it's the part where the identity that is occupying the center of the frame, like you zoom out an order of magnitude, and now that person is just in the corner of the of the frame. And it's not that that's like, I don't regard that specifically as ego death per se, but to the, ex- but then again, you know, Ram Dass has that whole thing about, um, Neem Karoli Baba asking if, I think it was, this is, I'm getting this right. Asking what if death is just like taking off a shoe that's too tight. Oh, right. Yep. You death know, death that, is completely safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but that it's like specifically it's, it's the removal of a restriction. Yep. Mm-hmm. on identity. Uh, and so at, you know, so to the extent that every, every developmental threshold is a threshold where you're stepping, it's like you're stepping out into a wider and more complete, maybe not complete, like there's, maybe there's no end to it, but a more comprehensive self. Right. Then it does require a, a, re- a, re- a release of the exclusive identity with the prior thing, you know? So like when people give up on religion, you know, if they've raised in a super religious family and then you decide that there's something more and a lot of people, you know, like Richard Dawkins is a great example of somebody who never properly digested that move, mm-hmm. never like found a way to include the, the, the earlier self construct in the new self construct. And so it just, again, it's like that guy I was talking about earlier. It's like, it just lingers there in the shadow yeah. and like exerts, like, you know, per- perpetrates all sorts of unspeakable violence onto people because it's, it's there, but it's just not acknowledged. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your, your thing, but I do think that it's just sort of a constant, like, you know, zooming out to include more and more. And that if you get, you know, then there, there are a lot of, you know, how, how fucked is it if you're like, uh, you know, on the international space station, but like you're just covering (laughs) your eyes except for when you're like flying over your hometown, you know, (laughs) you're just like, nah, 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 nah. (laughs) And like, I think that's like, all of us are doing that to some degree. Yeah. Because you, you can't really, because like it development is hard, like it hurts, mm-hmm. you know? And so sometimes it is just easier to just like ignore that pain and the opportunity to find a place for that pain, you know? Yeah. And it seems like a natural reaction to want to kind of reassemble a new structure as quickly as you possibly can. You know, I, I'm I'm definitely going through a period of sort of expansion and growth right now, and it is painful. And it helps to remember that um, it is also, you know, it is an opportunity where you don't you don't really have to know where you're going to end up, or you can't really know. You know, you've got to kind of. Uh, there are some days where you feel like, oh yeah, okay, I see where our things are headed. I think, and things are going to be all right. This is working out. And then there's going to be other days where it just feels like, 
wh- who am I? Where is it? Where was, you know, where's the person that I was and who am I going to be? You know, what's going on here? But um, I think that I have found a little bit of that, you know, when the rigidness of your personality gets loosened up a little bit, some of the intuitive type feelings can sort of rise to the surface a little bit sometimes, maybe not always super clearly, but I mean, maybe it kind of like you had mentioned, you've been doing some more meditation, um, kind of inspired by, uh, trying to cope with depression if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah. 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 I mean like that's, that's, that's sort of a last year's story. I've slipped back into not meditating, not meditating. nearly as much as, 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 as much yeah. as I would like. Yeah. But that's, that's just part of being a, what the Buddhists call a householder, <laughs> right? Sure. Like when are you like, you really got to fight for your, your meditation time with a baby and that kind of thing and a new so, job. But so yeah. while you were meditating, is that something that you felt like sort of helped that connection with that, um, intuition for lack of a better term? I mean, it definitely does. It definitely does. I think, um, Again, you know, maybe like if you were to to to, to call back to that original uh, that that story I was telling earlier, like I think if you're like meditating and smoking hash at the same time, <laughs> it's like it's like training for a marathon with weights on. Sure, you know, like you're you're actually. Um, or I think about that a lot with respect to having a social media job. Mm-hmm. You know, like the amount of noise. Uh, in my daily life is just astounding. And I think that's true of most of us. And so it's good to, you know, again, in terms of like putting the cart before the horse and trying to like master, you know, graduate level stuff before you tackle the intro level course. I think a lot of us are getting confused around, um, like there is a time, there is, there's a time where it's important in like, like I was doing with the, with my original sort of inquiry into intuition, I was asking these questions in low stakes yeah. environments. Like I wasn't, I wasn't like trying to learn about how to listen to my intuitive voice, like while, uh, you know, fighting a bear or yeah. whatever, you know, like I was, I was like, Hey, should I take a left or a right out, out of the door today, this morning? And I'll, you know, it's a different way to work or whatever. And I think that we get into a similar sort of it's it's a potential pitfall to think that we can cultivate the core or kernel of awareness um, in these extremely noisy spaces. Mm. Um, at least that's not the easiest way to do it. Like that's that's uh, I definitely got slapped by uh, my uh, one of my, my mentors and teachers now, uh, Richard Doyle, who, you know, was, was saying basically that I've, I've, I kind of have my head up my ass, uh, a couple <laughs> weeks ago because I was just so preoccupied with like memes and like witty repartee and all of this stuff. And that, that, uh, all of that stuff is, is noise, you know, and that, the, 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 the that's, that stuff that, um, you can bring mindfulness to, you can bring presence and awareness to, you can engage, you can enter a flow state in engagement with these things. But like, uh, frankly, I would like rather work on my reflexes before I'm putting my hand in the blender, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's, it's tricky. So I don't know. I think, I think that, uh, yes, meditation helps cultivate intuition and, it's certainly an easier place to it's certainly an easier place to cultivate the the re, like to play the rests to bar you know use it like a musical analogy yeah you know like there it is easier to hear something like a pin drop when <laughs> you know, everyone, everyone comes to a stop mm-hmm. in the song and like, you can get really good. You can train your hearing to hear really, really small sounds inside a really large sound. Yeah. But 
but you're probably never going to notice that sound in the first place if you're just like constantly in in the pandemonium. Yeah, no, you know? that's great. I mean, I think for me, it's easy to start getting wrapped up trying to get in touch with your intuition, like you said, when you're kind of knee deep in some shit, you know what I mean? Like when you're having some uh, tough experience in life and then all of a sudden you want to tap into some intuition to help you figure it out. But I like the sort of approaching it in a low stakes form as sort of a just an inquisitive practice um so you can kind of just explore it and not feel like it has to answer some some impending difficult question for you and then also i mean for me sometimes i've felt like feeling like i need to be in touch with some sort of deep intuition or authentic authentic authenticity it sometimes can almost do a little bit more harm than good in a way where it's it's like yeah exactly it's like i'm can be focusing on something that's like multiple layers out before just dealing with the immediacy of like oh here's an emotion i'm gonna allow myself to feel it you know what i mean so i can move through it rather than I have an emotion that I'm feeling and so I'm going to try to intellectualize it by getting in touch with some intuition to solve some problem. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think also that that sort of, that's, that's a kind of a typical uh, cosmology, but I'm, I'm more fond of the, the version that puts intuition at the root of aware, at, at the root of our experience mm. that, you know, really, uh, all of this is happening. Like everything, every, every sense experience, every thought or emotion we have, first of all, we know that in the, in the brain that like logical thought, what we, you know, think of as like higher levels of, of analytic or, you know, uh, self-reflexive thought are actually made out of emotional thought, mm. you know, that like the logic of, emotional thought is what creates the substrate or the basis for like your, your, your rationality is built out of feelings, right? You know, and yep. your feelings are built out of sensations and your sensations are themselves like, uh, you know, intuitive apprehensions, sure. you know? So it's like in, intuition is actually the ground floor of this thing, I think. Right. And, and it's not, um, it's not some sort of, you know, if we're if we're trying to reach beyond ourselves to attain it, then we're making a mistake. In the same way, again, that like right. Eric Wargos suggests that precognition is not this like skill that is unique to highly developed, you know, uh, you know Hindu sages or whatever, or like special psychically disposed people. That into that that precognition is actually a function of every brain. Because every brain is a, you know, is a is a, a, a quantum phenomenon <clears throat> that's in which you know he he sort of argues that it's it's, it's a four dimensional object that's computing that's smearing its 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 computing process across times, mm. you know, um, and so like in the same way that we witness the funky weird shit going on at the subatomic level in the laboratory when we do quantum experiments that we're made out of that stuff. And so like if the particle is acting with knowledge of its own future, right. Then, then it's not like the particle is some sort of pinnacle of human evolution. It's like literally the shit that we're made out of, right. You know, so it's, intuition, yeah. intuition again, in that respect is, uh, a you know a a stripping away of the I interpretive embe and structural embellishments that we have placed upon uh, like much that. much much more simpler much simpler forms of knowing i like you know? that yeah yeah maybe my uh, me saying it you know sort of proposing it as an outward reaching thing i think that's it's funny that I said that because I think what I'm noticing is, you know, maybe to reach that core, if there's feelings there that you're sort of not acknowledging, you have to sort of acknowledge those feelings before you can go deeper. 
And so sometimes the, you know, thinking about an issue and sort of playing off of both sides over the top of the emotion, you know, you're sort of keeping yourself, keeping yourself detached from the emotion by intellectualizing something. And so that's what I think I'm recognizing when I say that out there, it's like I'm out here intellectualizing something. And then when you sort of stop and ask yourself, well, like, what's the feeling, you know, and you feel the feeling, it's like, then maybe you can rest a little bit deeper and get closer to that, that core you're talking about. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, who's, who's feeling the feeling right. like that's like the feeling is not just some, like, even that is like an abstraction of, you know, which is why like a lot of that sort of Esalen, uh, you know, that, that sort of first wave hippie, uh, movement, um, exploring human potential in the United States, uh, was not entirely wrong when they were talking about losing your mind and coming to your senses. Because mm-hmm. it's like, the, you know, the mind as like a, the, the, the intellect as a superstructure on top of these like simpler forms of cognition in which uh, the, the self and other as conceptual objects are not, uh, like those are emergent Mm. You know, like you feel like my baby is feeling things right now, but she's not thinking I'm feeling this thing. Totally. You know, and so like that, the, you know, to, to attend to immediate experience in that way. And what I, uh, you know, the, the so-called the simple feeling of being, yep. um, that's, it's, that is sort of the, uh, you know, like an archaeology of consciousness, like you're, you're getting, you're getting under all of that stuff and back to like the stuff that that stuff evolved out mm, of, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So. Well, shit, man. I know you've been, uh, podcasting here for, I don't know how many hours now. <laughs> if you can Forever. Clear, clear for me. <laughs> so I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to keep you, keep you, uh, sitting there with your headphones on, but, um, this was great, man. I, Thanks so much for coming on. I really d- dig talking to you. I feel like each one of those things we touched on, I could have <laughs> kept going on for another hour each. So, well, you know, once you've given uh, a lot of women and and uh, people of color a spot on your podcast, we can circle back around. <laughs> <and maybe. laughs> hey, I've got a I've got a few women, one of color already, so I'm doing pretty good so far. Yeah, I mean it's not, you know, it's not a uh, it's not a checklist, but no, it's just I like I'm sure that I'm sure that you would prefer that your show represent the the, you know, as much of the human experience as possible. Yeah, yeah. You get better you get better results that way. Yeah, I'd love to get all sorts of people on. So, um but yeah, I'd definitely love to talk to you again, man. If you if yeah. you if you got time, I'm all about it. Likewise, Jacob. Thanks, man. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh shit. As far as like <laughs> when I do notes and all that, I mean, I know all your stuff and I, I want to put all your stuff on there, but is there anything in particular like, you know, you really want people to know about or want me to send them to? Um, my web life is a disaster at the moment. Like I'm desperately in need of a new website. But for the time being, uh, if you go to Michael Garfield Art dot com, then it has links to all of the other things. Okay. So at the top of that, it has links to the music and it has links to the the podcast and I think the you know the writing and the Patreon and otherwise, otherwise I'd have to send you like five different places. So okay. I would just say, sweet, that's the that's the place to go. How's your book coming along? We should not talk about the book. <laughs> no, <laughs> dude, the book is the book is um, the book is. Uh, I need I need to approach it from a different angle. I need to take a step back. Mm. I've got I'm I'm like I'm stuck on one very important chapter and I need to just like detonate that and write five other different chapters about something <laughs> else. Like again it's like that that issue of like you know writer's block is when you're like too attached to a particular identity or a particular outcome and like I have the rest like I I have much more I could be working on I could be much much closer to the 
fulfillment of that process. But there's this just one chapter that is just that is like lodged in my throat and has been for like a, <laughs> over over a year. Some undigested you know? stuff there. Yeah. So <laughs> I, it's that's you know it's like I don't want to, I don't want to die stuck on that particular thing so maybe i need to chase it with some other some mm. you know like eat some other stuff some digestive and it, bitters or something yeah 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 <laughs> so the answer is the answer is the book is um there's the other problem of like learning too fast and then like n- not knowing how to fit the all of the things that you've just learned into the statement that you were trying to make mm. You know, Mm -hmm. and so like I think right now I'm in a big process of integration, and that's a big part of why the writing is going as slowly as it is. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're a busy dude too with everything you got going on. Yeah, I gotta hang out with the baby. Exactly. All right. Otherwise. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, you too, man. Let's do it again soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Take it easy. You have been listening to Awake, Aware, Alive. I've recorded like six of these outros and deleted them. And I just realized that I was asking for ratings and reviews. And you know what? I haven't even left Michael Garfield's podcast, Future Fossils, a rating and review. So I got to do that because how can I be asking for people to do it for me if I'm not doing it for my favorite stuff? So after I get off this, I'm going to go and leave Future Fossils a glowing review and a five-star rating. And I hope you do the same.